Well, like Nathan, I, uh, I don't think I've ever heard of that hymn either, but it might have just preached a better sermon than you're going to hear. It's at least on uh, the same theme as we take up the people of God as the wisdom of God and centers our thoughts on the people of God as the temple. We're going to eventually look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, we will get there eventually. But before we do so, I want to ask you a question. What is the glory of your hometown? What is the glory of your hometown? If you're from here, if you're from Charlotte, maybe you would say the Bank of America Tower and Uptown or the Bank of America Stadium or maybe the tree-lined boulevards of Myers Park. Certainly each of these have their own glory. If you're from uh, Washington, D.C., where my family lived for almost eight years and three of our children were born, it's unmistakably the architecture that is seen in that city, especially the Capitol building with its famous dome. So important to the landscape is the Capitol building that according to an 1899 statute, no structure may be taller, may be built taller than the Capitol. That's why D.C. really doesn't have any super tall buildings like many big cities across America do. What is then the glory of your hometown, but also what is the wisdom of your hometown? What makes it go? What's its genius? If you're from Charlotte, maybe you'd say, uh, historically, the hospitality that was found in this sleepy southern town or city. But maybe now we would say the contemporary wizardry with numbers, the financial markets. Well, if you're from D.C., it'd be the representative government at work in places like the Capitol building. But as we know, the wisdom of a place can be corrupted. Its genius can become its utter stupidity. Human sin hollows out and inverts what is good and wise. What is the glory of ancient Israel? Specifically, the glory of Jerusalem, the capital, the crown of ancient Israel. What was the temple, the glory of of ancient Israel was her temple. During the time of Jesus, the outward walls of the temple were covered with so much gold that they were to quote Josephus, blinding in fiery splendor at sunrise. Its beauty was so well known that in the words of the Mishnah, no one has seen a truly beautiful building unless he has seen the temple. So you can imagine the shock when Jesus said, destroy this temple, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Or when he was leaving the temple and going away and his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, how did he answer them? You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be one left here, one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. It seemed Jesus intended to do something transformational, touching on the glory of Israel. He intended to do something transformational, touching on the temple. If the temple was a certain glory of Israel, what was the wisdom? What was the wisdom of Israel? Well, like the buildings and institutions of the American cities, I mentioned Charlotte and Washington, D.C., the glory is in some sense the outward manifestation of that inner substantial wisdom. The great wisdom of Israel was that in the temple, God meets with his people. In the temple, through its ceremonies, God purifies his people. What did David say in Psalm 27? One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And God used the work of the priests at the temple in order to purify 
the people of God from their sins through the sacrifices administered by those priests. Just as Jesus targeted the glory of the temple, he also addressed the wisdom of the temple, its work in his day. Remember Matthew 21, verses 12 through 13. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. What could be said is the wisdom of the temples is tied up with its glory and a diminishment in the wisdom of the temple eventually is a diminishment, a lessening of the glory. The glory and wisdom of the temple, they were being transformed in Jesus' day. Through Jesus and through his work, he is transforming and he is seeking for us to understand something through this transformation about the church. The wisdom and the glory of the temple, he's transforming through himself and through that he is teaching us something fundamental about what it means to be the people of God. We're in week three in a series on the communion of saints in the church, looking at who we are as the people of God. And what we'll see tonight is the transformation brought about by Jesus, highlighting how in that transformation, the way we understand ourselves as the people of God is in many ways paradoxical. Now, a paradox, as you know, is a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense but yet is true at the same time. On the face of it, it strikes us as nonsense, but in the paradox, there is something fundamentally true, and we will see this paradoxical element to our existence as the people of God as we follow in the train of Jesus. Now, our guiding text this evening is Ephesians 3, so if you already have that open, I'm gonna be reading verses 1 through 13 of Ephesians 3. Hear the word of the Lord. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have built boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege here on your day to be able to come again and feast on the word of God. We pray that your spirit would be here softening our hearts to receive this word, to believe this word, and to follow this word. I pray that you would preach uh, through me a better sermon than that which I have prepared, that we might see Christ, we might behold Christ, and that we might live for him in the midst of the week ahead of us. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Have you ever started to say something and then realized you, you need to back up? You need to back up and provide some background, some context for further understanding to what you were trying to say. So you make a parenthetical statement in order for people that are hearing you to get the big picture, to have some perspective on what you're saying. You often get these in movies, you get them in novels, flashback scenes providing understanding for the context of a story. One of the great ones in recent memory in a movie I've watched was the movie Up. Uh, you remember the movie Up, a beautiful movie about an old man, his house, a boy, and some balloons. And the movie starts with a beautiful parenthetical um, sort of montage of this man and his beloved wife, their love and their life. And that montage functions parenthetically in the course of the whole movie to give you understanding for what follows. Well, in verses 1 to 13 here of Ephesians, we have one long parenthetical comment that has to do with the Gentiles and the Apostle Paul's role with those Gentiles. And uh, Paul interrupts here his train of thought to provide some much-needed background. In Ephesians, the apostle has been unpacking the glorious eternal plan of God, and he's been praying that the Ephesians would have eyes to see it and to know its power and its wisdom in themselves. That's essentially what he does in chapter 1 of Ephesians. And then in chapter 2, Paul shows how God has begun to fulfill his eternal purposes to reclaim and to redeem his creation through his people in Christ. And we see how the grace of God stored up in his eternal plan manifest in Christ has begun to be applied to those who now find themselves reconciled not only to God but also to one another in Christ. And just as Paul stopped in Ephesians 1, famously at the end of Ephesians 1, to pray, and he prays right after unpacking the glory of God's plan, so here, after chapter 2, the plan, it seems, by Paul is to again stop and pray that the Ephesians would be rooted and strengthened in the love of God. But before he does that, Paul needs to give some background and some personal color to the message that he is seeking to get across to the Ephesians and to us here this evening. Now, the reason we know this is parenthetical between the end of chapter 2 and verse 14 of chapter 3 is how it begins. Look there. It says, for this reason, I. For this reason, I. He starts that in verse 1 before turning from that to some personal comments. And then he picks back up again in verse 14, right after where I ended my reading. There he says again, for this reason. So that ties back to what he's about to say, which connects back to the end of chapter 2 regarding the work of God's grace uh, in our lives. And so... Between the end of chapter 2 and then the beginning of verse 14 in chapter 3, he provides this parenthetical comment to provide some context and perspective. So as we look at this passage, we're especially looking at the theme introduced in verse 10. The theme introduced in verse 10 where Paul says it is to be through the church that the manifold wisdom of God is made known. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known. And we're going to look at this theme about the manifold wisdom of God as the church as the wisdom of God through four points. The first is the rootedness of God's wisdom. The second, the question of God's wisdom. Thirdly, an example of God's wisdom and then fourthly, the paradox of God's wisdom. So first, the rootedness, the rootedness of God's wisdom. There are two words that help us unlock the rootedness of God's wisdom, two words that do not mean what we might think they mean. 
And those two words are mystery and progressive. Mystery and progressive. Paul uses the word mystery four times in this passage. Now, when we think of mystery, what do we think? We think of something dark, obscure, secret, puzzling. What is mysterious is inexplicable. It's incomprehensible. Why would anyone root for the New York Yankees, right? Why would anyone cheer for the Michigan Wolverines? This is, this is a mystery. This is inexplicable. Well, in the Greek, this secret, this mystery, is no longer closely guarded. It's not this ineffable truth, but it's open. Now, originally it referred to a truth into which someone was initiated, it was used to refer to secret mystery religions into which you needed to be brought in through secret rites only they knew. But in Christianity, in the New Testament sense, there's no esoteric mysteries that are only reserved for the spiritually elite, the knowing ones. On the contrary, Christian mysteries are truths which, though beyond human discovery, have been revealed by God, and so now are open and available to the whole church. John Stott, commenting on mystery, says, it is a truth hitherto hidden from human knowledge or understanding, but now is disclosed by the revelation of God. That's mystery, and you'll see here, this, this word mystery is intertwined with our second word, which helps us unlock the rootedness of God's wisdom, and that's progressive. Now, this doesn't mean a particular brand of politics or secular view of historical progress. It means that God's revelation occurs over time, and as it occurs over time, it builds on itself. It progresses, and because it builds on itself, there has been mystery. For example... In order to prepare for Christ and an understanding of who he is, he needed to establish a sacrificial system among his people that taught the seriousness of sin, the the, uh, necessity of blood, of atonement, and so forth. But as those elements of the sacrificial system were established in the first five books of the Bible, what they eventually pointed to was not clear at the time, right? It was not clear at the time to those that received them exactly what they ultimately led to. But with the progressive unfolding of God's revelation, especially the capstone of that revelation in the person and work of Jesus Christ, that mystery is revealed. And that is the focus of the mystery revealed in progressive revelation, the mystery of Christ the Messiah, and what Paul's doing here is saying that this one who has come, the God-man, who has founded a people and calls people to repent and to worship him, is not new. You know, to be a, a new religion in ancient Near East, that was no good. You wanted to be established in the old. You wanted to show your bona fides through showing how rooted you were and to And so what Paul does here is is establishing the roots of his message, that Christ is part of a long-awaited mystery of God that is older than even the world itself because it emerges from an eternal plan of God. Now, with the clarity provided by progressive revelation, the mystery of Christ and all that God plans to do in him is revealed. And what is this? What is the particular mystery that was unfolded over time and emerging at that time of Paul? Now, I've already said in some sense it's centered on Christ, but there's a particular truth, a particular aspect of what Christ is bringing about here in the mystery that Paul is concerned with. And this is the question of God's wisdom, which relates to the Gentiles in the people of God, and Paul's connection to those Gentiles and the church. And so that is our second point, the question of God's wisdom. 
we might ask, before Christ in the Old Testament, weren't the Gentiles in God's plan? Didn't God's promise, didn't he promise he would bless all nations through Abraham's seed as he gave his covenant to Abraham? Don't we have examples of Gentiles such as Ruth and Naaman in the Old Testament coming to become a people, part of the people of God? Yes, indeed we do. But how did they come into being a part of the people of God? By taking on circumcision, by becoming a part of Israel. You essentially became a Jew in order to become a part of God's covenant people. But now, through Christ, no longer are there Jewish boundary markers, such as circumcision, to the people of God. As Paul made clear in the previous chapter of Ephesians, Ephesians 2, There's now a people of God whose character is international, and it encompasses both Jew and Gentile. We are members of the same body, the body of Christ. One side doesn't become the other. They are both in Christ. And Paul teaches this by using three words in the Greek that emphasize the Gentiles are in no way inferior as they gain Uh, riches in Christ. Three words that show they're in no way inferior. And we translate these as fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise. Fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the same promise. Each of those words in the Greek begins with sin. Now, not the English word sin, S-I-N, but the the word S-Y-N. We would recognize that in English through synonym, through synonym, which means a different word that means roughly the same thing. You find the synonyms in the thesaurus, right, to expand your vocabulary, to mix up the words you're writing in a document. Well, this prefix, sin, S-Y-N, means with. It means with. Both Jews and Gentiles have Christ. Both have the riches. Both inherit the promises. They are with one another in this. And this is the great mystery, the great mystery that has been unfolding, which is Paul's great passion. This is what has been stored up, and that for which God has been preparing for there to be one people, members of one body who have Christ as their head. This people is not circumscribed by land, by ethnicity, by language, by civil law. The only border it knows is the one formed by Christ in faith and discipleship in him. And it is this boundary of faith that Paul was called to preach, not the boundary of Jewishness. No, that one must repent and believe in Christ, and then riches and unity are found in him. Now, in verses 8 to 10, we see that Paul has been entrusted to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, this boundary of faith in him, to three groups. Verse 8, you see it's the Gentiles, Verse 9, you see it's to all people, to to everyone. And so human beings, they're the primary target here. But there's this interesting third group that we find that Paul's message of the mystery of what God is doing is heard by, maybe indirectly here. But it's angels. Angels are involved here. Principalities and powers in heavenly places. Rulers, authorities. And we see that the first result of Paul's preaching of the unsearchable riches of Christ and the mystery of God has has given to him uh, in the birth and growth of the church. And in that church is seen the manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God. Now the word for manifold in Greek means many colored, many colored. Colored, And it was used to describe flowers, crowns, embroidered cloth, 
woven carpets. So the, the church is, is like a beautiful tapestry in many races and languages and cultures that are all found in Christ. No other community resembles the church in its wide range of colorful backgrounds that find in Christ a fundamental unity. For all our cultures striving after the idol of diversity, it cannot compare to the diversity and harmony of the church stretched out in time and in place. It's God's new society. And this many-colored fellowship of the church is a reflection of the many-colored wisdom of God. As one commentator put it, as the gospel spreads throughout the world, this new and variegated Christian community develops. It is as if a great drama is being enacted. History is the theater, the world is the stage, the church members in every land are the actors. God himself has written the play and he directs and produces it. Act by act, scene by scene, the story continues to unfold. But who is the audience? Who is the audience? And this brings us back to, to this group, this group that Paul is preaching to. Yes, the Gentiles, yes, everyone, but there's something here of the manifold wisdom of God being displayed to these observers, these principalities and authorities, these spiritual powers who exercise authority in the heavens and influence events on the earth. They are designed here to learn this wisdom that Paul is preaching. This is a part of God's plan. Now these terms, principalities and authorities, they can refer to good angels. Um, outside of a particular context in scripture, the words themselves can simply refer to spiritual beings which can be good or they can be evil. We know that good angels were interested in the unfolding plan of God, the unfolding mystery of God, because we see in 1 Peter 1.12 that the content of the gospel of Christ is something that angels long to look into. But it seems likely here that Paul is including, if not focusing here specifically on, the hostile spiritual powers. The hostile spiritual powers who are being exposed to this great mystery of God's unfolding plan. Now in Ephesians 1, Paul explained that Christ has been exalted far above every principality, authority, power, and dominion. And now it has become evident that God is freeing the Gentiles from control of evil principalities, evil authorities, and he's uniting them to his people. That's what we learned in chapter two of Ephesians. And this recalls Jesus saying in his gospels, that only when the strong man has been bound can his possessions be taken from him. And Christ has bound the strong man, that is the devil. He's bound him through his work on the cross and now is taking from him. The men and the women who were the slaves of the evil one, his property, he's taking them and he's joining them to the church. And the way the evil rulers and authorities have learned of God's mysterious plan, kept secret until now, is by counting their losses. They're watching as the church grows, as Christ claims more and more through the preaching of the gospel for himself in his people. And this is the, only the beginning. Do they see where this is headed, these evil principalities in powers. God has a plan for the fullness of time to sum up all things in Christ, in heaven and on earth. And the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles and their incorporation into the church is a sign that the spiritual powers which raged heavy in the world are coming to an end and an age of their dominion is ceasing. They are losing control. And so it should come as no surprise that they attempt to resist what God is doing. 
There is spiritual conflict, and Paul talks about that spiritual warfare later in Ephesians 6. But Paul says that in the church, the body of Christ, he is showing his wisdom, and that wisdom is to confound all realities, heavenly or earthly, so that we know God's plan is inevitable. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The question of God's wisdom in the church is the inclusion of those who are now fellow citizens and saints, members of the household of God, the Gentiles along with the Jews. And in God's plan is the mystery that is especially being proclaimed through this most unlikely of instruments, the Apostle Paul, who becomes for us, our third point, an example of God's wisdom. Now, what if I were to stand up here as I preach here this evening and tell you just last week I was in prison? And some years ago, I spent months in prison. It's not true. I can't can't fib here and say that is somehow true, but let's let's play along with a what if. Would this be a badge of honor, a sign of something good and prestigious in my life? Or would it be shameful? Would it cause you to immediately question who I am, question even the legitimacy as a minister of the gospel? People that get arrested, we think, are up to no good. People who get arrested and spend time in jail or at the bottom of society should be treated with suspicion. That is our cultural assumption, anyway. Well, being in prison in Paul's day was not any less horrible. It was a source of shame. It was a a place of weakness. And Paul here, as he talks about himself in Ephesians 3, he strips the varnish off. He hides nothing to reveal his current lot in life. And in Ephesians, Paul has been talking about the glory of God and his plan and his love and his grace for the church. And now he says, let me tell you about myself. I've been telling you about the glory and the majesty of God and what he's doing But let me tell you about me. He doesn't insert himself here, though, to draw attention to himself. I believe he inserts himself here for two main reasons. To connect his own ministry to this new thing that God is about among the Gentiles. But secondly, he inserts himself to illustrate the nature of God's message and the wisdom of God's people in this world, which is this, strength through weakness. Strength through weakness. Strength is found in weakness. Think about how remarkable it is that God would call Paul, Paul to to minister to, to, to Gentiles. Paul was chosen to be a minister to the Gentiles despite his hateful behavior toward them in the past. Choosing Paul is a bit like, let's say Hitler didn't kill himself at the at the end of World War II in his bunker, and he ended up being ambassador to the state of Israel. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. No human sense. You go for the ambassador, you go for somebody that has good relations, maybe shares a lot, culturally has has shown uh, some favor in the past in order to minister or relate to a particular people. But no, here, God picks Paul. Remember, Paul persecuted Christians. He was even complicit in the murder of Stephen in Acts 7. And because of this, he calls himself, in the superlative sense, the least of all the saints. And in the Greek, this this superlative of least is actually a a comparative. It might be translated, I'm leaster. We don't have a word for that. We find throughout Paul's writings how aware he was of his background, that he formally blasphemed and persecuted and insulted Jesus Christ and his people. And he reminds himself of this for his own humility's sake, but he reminds his readers and us of this to remind us of God's wisdom, of how he works. Power is from God, not from him. And that power will sometimes show up in the least expected places. 
So this great ministry of the inclusion of the Gentiles into the people of God is given to Paul, the most unlikely of people. And this highlights for us the work and power of God through paradox, through paradox. Just as his own ministry is a paradox, so the church is not naturally mighty, is full of former sinners, and yet through it, through its apparent weakness, God is bringing about a whole new creation. So Paul here is an example of God's wisdom and highlights the principle of paradox in God's wisdom in this world. And that leads us to our last and fourth point, the paradox of God's wisdom. I started off this sermon noticing the glory of Israel was the temple. And in that temple, the wisdom is Israel was revealed as it is there that God met his people and purified them from their sins. And this is still true, but it's been transformed through Christ. When Christ said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, he was talking about himself. No longer was the physical temple in Israel to be the meeting place of God with his people. Jesus is that meeting place. Place. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt could be translated tabernacled. The word of God tabernacled among us. Jesus is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. At Jesus' crucifixion, the curtain that shielded the inner room of the temple was torn. Why is this significant? Hebrews tells us that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that accomplished what the temple in Jerusalem never could. Through Jesus' sacrifice and victory, he made a way for God, not only to dwell with his people, but for God to dwell in his people. And here's the amazing truth about God's people. Because we have been joined with Christ, not only is he the temple, so are we. So are we. Just before this passage, at the end of chapter 2, Paul speaks of a holy temple that is growing upon the foundation of apostles and prophets with Christ as the cornerstone, with God's people as living stones who are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, what does that teach us about the glory and wisdom of the people of God? No longer do we look for a magnificent building in a particular locale. No longer do we look to repeated sacrifices. We look to Christ, and we look to how he intends for himself and who he is and what his character is to be worked out into us. What are two of the most important moments of this transformed temple of Jesus Christ? What are two of his most important moments? The bookends of his life, his birth, and his death, his birth into a fragile womb of a virgin, teenage, Jewish, young woman, and his shameful death by way of the implement of capital punishment in Rome. We celebrate these as Christians, and sometimes in our celebrations of them, we maybe lose their fundamental weak, shameful character. They are weak in the eyes of the world. They are moments of great divine strength, but that great divine strength is revealed through a fundamental weakness. And Paul was an example of God's wisdom because he embodied this Christ example. God is going to meet his people and purify his people through acts of great weakness. This morning, Kevin quoted Psalm 8.2. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength. That's a paradoxical statement. It is paradoxical that we heard these Hebrew midwives who saved the sons of Israel would be the wisdom of God and reveal the glory of God more than mighty Pharaoh. And when Christ came and taught us the character of his people, he didn't hold up for us Herod, he didn't hold up for us Caesar. What did he say to us? Let 
the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of heaven. The wisdom of God in the people of God is that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We carry around the weakness of his death that the life of Jesus might shine through. The cross comes before resurrection, before the crown. In humility, we follow Christ. We take up our crosses. We follow him. And then through that wisdom, we see the glory of Christ shine through. When the wisdom of Christ's weakness is manifest in us, then that is his glory. It is through that that he works his power. We saw that in the Apostle Paul's own life and ministry. It is also so in the church until Christ comes again. And I admit, and we must all admit, this can, this can demand of us eyes of faith to see because it is so against what surrounds us and the glory that our eyes are naturally drawn to. But this is the wisdom and the glory of Christ, and it's the wisdom and glory that is being revealed in the church. And so let me finish by reminding us of this abiding spiritual principle of how God has chosen to work. It's illustrated over and over again in the Old and New Testament. It's illustrated over and over again in our lives. Think of Israel. God tells them in Deuteronomy that he didn't choose them because they were great, because they were powerful, because they were wise, because they were lovely. He chose them despite themselves so that through them he might manifest his power and bring glory to himself. We see it in more specific stories. Think of David and Goliath. There in, in Goliath, you have the strength of the world illustrated. A giant, big, proud, victorious. And then you have God's people illustrated in David, the youngest, ruddy. Yet in the shame of his people, the shame in the eyes of the world, God brings victory. He demonstrates his wisdom. He demonstrates his genius, how he works. And the same with Paul, the same with the church. Let us pray. Let us watch ourselves that this way that God works becomes something that we are in line with, that we are on board with, that we live by, that we seek to order our own understanding of ourselves, of the church, and the world by it. And again, this will require of us eyes of faith to see wisdom and weakness, to glimpse glory in the shadows of the cross. But as God gives us faith, let us look to Christ who has gone before us. Let me finish before I pray by reading Colossians 3, 1 to 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, it can sometimes be hard as we live this Christian life with our natural eyes not being able to see the wisdom and the power of Christ in his ways. But Father, you have worked within us by the Spirit, faith, and you give us glimpses of your way. And we thank you for this passage from the Apostle Paul, even his own example, that you have ordained to work through weakness and to reveal to us your glory through that weakness. But we do look forward, Father, as we are hidden with Christ in God and we await his second coming, we look forward when faith becomes sight and we will see the grand manifold wisdom and glory of Christ as he returns
and fills the whole earth. But as you have given to us now to live in this in-between time, grant us increasingly the eyes of faith to live in weakness, to rely in humility on Christ and to see his power course through us, not only individually, but we pray that for Christ's covenant, that we would behold who Christ is, his wisdom would be in our midst and that his glory would be revealed to us. We pray in his name, amen.